am I? Where is my root? What has happened to my culture? Who am I worshipping? What happened to us? Well, hello everybody. My name is Fumi Inyonda and this is Public Eye. Today's conversation is going to be about traditional religion. What is the role of traditional religion in nation building? Is there anything to be said about the space we are at as a people in the determination and desire to pull millions of people out of poverty and build a modern society? Is there a place for our core beliefs through traditional religion? It's going to be, I promise you, a fascinating conversation because we have a very interesting group of people who are going to go into this conversation with us. But at the end of the day, you are going to be the one to determine what works and what doesn't work. I enjoy you to sit back and enjoy today's show on traditional religion. See you soon. Right, it's public eye and it's a very unusual conversation, I will admit to you, because everybody kept saying, so what's religion, traditional religion got to do with it? It's like, what's love got to do with it? But then I'm going to ask the right people what I hope to be the right questions. I'm going to start with the gentleman on my right-hand side, Mr. Ejiro Onobakwai, is a cultural engineer. He adopts what is relevant in the Nigerian culture and presents it to the rest of the world as a testament of the Nigerian uniqueness. Hello, Mr. Onobupai. Good evening. Hello, good to see you. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Also, right beside me is someone I've been chasing around the world for a while. It's good to see her here because uh, when you see her, you understand what I mean. Ms. Wumi Olaya is a singer, songwriter, performer, and costume designer. I won't tell you all about everywhere she's been, but she is a person who has woven the, the culture and tradition of her own people, and I would, she would define more what we mean by her own people, into creativity and art. Good to see you. It's so wonderful to be here with you. You are the only one whose hair I want. <laughs> I've been chasing you too. <laughs> this is a good meet, yes. right. I mean, it's great to have both of you here because when we conceived this conversation, there was a lot of kickback. It was like, well, we don't even understand what is this conversation about and what does it have to do with development or the growth of a nation. Then I start asking that, you know, the one area of life in Nigeria where we have seemed to embrace on some level you know, what is considered to be the culture, the pre-colonial culture, to certain extent, is art. You know, what is it about art that makes it more, yeah, more digestible for the people in terms of being who they were before all of this? Let me start with you, Ejo. Thank you. <clears throat> Our people have lived with art for a very long time. Art has been part of their lives, their culture and their tradition. It's a form of expression. Um, they're observing their environment, the animals, the people and the lifestyle. And they're trying to document it somehow through art. Such that um, they may not have, have the, the Western type of documentation, but there are ways of showing how their lives have transformed from one form to the other, how they have traveled from one place to the other, the kind of animals they meet, the kind of um, um, uh, their lifestyle, and everything about them. So that is why art is digestible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is this the same thing with music? You know, uh, why, for example, let me ask you a controversial question. Why is it easier to say, I'm an African artist, and everybody is happy. Or I say, I'm an African traditional doctor, medical doctor, medicine doctor, or I'm a herbalist, or I'm a babalao. Hmm. I think that comes to the fact that the doctrine over years and years was about running away from who we are. And one of the things specifically that they wanted us to cut was the sense of religion. 
you couldn't have two. They could say you can't have two madams in a the house. They couldn't have two religions. You really can't have two madams well, in a house. Well, please, which house? It'll be, hard. Have there? It'll be hard. It's never worked, has it? So I feel particularly the whole colonial master knew that the way he could control the mind was to take away the one thing that held everything together, which is religion. Why religion? Because that's interesting. People, that's the bit that you, you find people, particularly younger people, kick him back. Yeah. Because they think, you know, what does religion, for example, have to do with anything else? That's okay, so we jump out and leave the religion alone, but at least we're still wearing our own clothes, we're still playing our own music, we're still eating our own food. So why is, why is religion key? Why is it important? Well, she spoke about us being unique. Um, before the pre, the colonial period, the colonial era, we as a people had an organized society an organized system, which, like she said, they came to break. And even the religion, so to speak, that comes from the West, it's not really from the West, it's, it comes from somewhere else. So we're actually absorbing second-hand religion, you know, from people that are learning from other people. Now, who are we really? What makes us different from other people? How did our ancestors survive? Because they actually did survive. May not be you know, as well as, but they survived. Otherwise, we wouldn't have come out. What were their secrets? What did they know? What did they worship? What did they believe? And what is their ways? How do they solve problems? Now, all the structures and systems existed before people came out to tell us, okay, let's look at things in a new way. There's this and there's that. Um, but this is superior, and yours, where you're coming from, is bad. And I question, I said, how could our original thinking be bad? Yes, there may have been some bad sides of it, like in every society, but how could it be bad? So my question is that we must investigate that aspect of our culture, our religion, our tradition that is useful, that is good. Yes, we may adopt some form of new and modern ideas, but we must adopt what gives us our sense of identity, which is very important. It's very important for us to know who we are. So what then does religion have to do with it? Because they will say this is some sort of revisionism and it's romanticizing the past, you know, that, a past that we don't even really know well. I think one of the things I've appreciated living in America in New York, is seeing the African Americans, what it took them to gain their confidence. It took them going back to research, just like my learned professor is talking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Knowing who you are in general takes so many facets. I was born in England, sent to Nigeria, spent 10 years, then went back to England. And the end thing that held me together was having this innate feeling that I knew who I was. Exactly. I walked into a name that I was given that I couldn't pronounce. Ibiwumi is my mm. name. Mm. As a child, I could barely say that word because it was like Ibiwumi. I came with an English accent. Everything was cockney. When I returned back to England, I started growing into Ibiwumi. Mm. Everything I did came from this African aspect. Mm. I never thought to question it at this point. I was comfortable in it. Mm. Even when my father thought maybe I should go and get training to speak my English properly because my English now had twisted, mm. I fought him. Because at this point, I wanted to stay who I am. Mm. Now, I had two junior sisters who were born and raised in England, do not speak a lick of Yoruba, only speak English. And I could not imagine who I would be if I hadn't been sent home. Mm. Mm. Now, I lived in a home that were Christian, went to church. There's a point where I also felt at a point where being a Christian wasn't what I felt. Being spiritual is what I truly felt. Yeah. And what did that mean? It meant appreciating all the various religion because religion to me is like a cult. I had, we had a conversation in there where they're talking about a cult. It's a place where you go to, if you're feeling lost, you go somewhere to go and find yourself. Mm. I didn't need to find myself anymore. Mm. I knew I was African, no matter where you take me to, no matter where I go. 
Yeah. First and foremost, it's the spirit that is within me that is speaking. Exactly. I mean, this is a very important, interesting place you came to because the argument for some is that many current modern civilizations have got where they are because they jettisoned religion. So, for example, even Europe, you know, many, many of the countries in Europe went through the process of, you know, different forms of, you know, religion. And then even with Christianity, different, that's where Protestant, uh, of all the, all, the, all the breakout Christianity also occurred. You know, and the same with Islam, there are breakdowns, you know, I mean, the, the same with Buddhism. I mean, the Hindus will tell you to have God knows how many. Yeah. That if part of becoming modern is jettisoning religion, and I said if, I'm not saying that mm -hmm. it is, why then does it matter to even begin to consider what our traditional, so-called traditional religion or religions may have been? We didn't give it up. We didn't choose to give that up. That was, there's a difference. When you outgrow something, where you've experienced something and you've learned that, okay, I don't need to be here. That was literally, you would, it was forced out to the point where some of the things that that religion gave to the people, they, they lost the whole herbal things, the understanding of what herbs to use. It was all part of that whole so-called so evil religion. I mean, that, I think that was also, and also the fact that it was taken in a way that, that was so brutal. Now, you can't help but go back to look at it to find out what was wrong about it. And especially when the religion that you've been fed to go into has not actually satisfied your soul, your spirit. Where else would you not go to if you're lost, but to go back to find out what you left behind? What role does it play in modern civilization for African societies, do you think? Let's start with Nigeria. What role will that sort of understanding play in? I mean, that's not going to stop politicians from being politicians, they say. That's not going to stop, you know, I mean, that's not going to repair our banking system. Yeah. That's not going to repair our healthcare system. That's not going to build roads. Yeah. That's what people say. So what is the point of this at all? I'll tell you, as human beings, we are seeking, we're looking for some kind of meaning. We are looking for purpose. We are looking for light. And um, somebody tells you, oh, this is the light. And you look at it. Oh, it looks like the light, yes. But deep within you, it's not satisfying. Because you know that there's an element of emptiness that is still there. So, yes, okay, fine. But you see something else. Oh, could this also be the light? Oh, let me find that. You go in and that sense of satisfaction is not there. But... When you become introspective and you go within yourself, which is where your identity lies, you find out that there are certain things you know subconsciously. Now, let's talk about a lot of new movements, especially things like Pentecostalism. It is an attempt to solve the daily challenges and the problems of people. Sometimes via miracles. So I say to people, my life is a miracle every day. I don't need any new miracles. My life is a miracle every day. And my life is beautiful every day. I found who I am. And so I am not confused. I am not, you know, I am not afraid. <laughs> There's nothing to be afraid about. But just to live by the tenets and the principles that guide us from within, you know, from within that push our identity out. And then you will survive from day to day and you will live successfully. I don't know if that answer is your question. It gives an inkling into what it is because, for example, as the challenge in Africa, all the conversations now, even with COVID, uh, development conversations, indices and all of that, it doesn't include Africa. It's as though Africa is not part of the world. You know, it is an ongoing understanding that Africa somehow lags behind at different points, you know, and different from country to country. You know, Nigeria being one of the ones that people are most interested in, given the size, our size and the resources that's, that's possible. So the question, therefore, is, you know, does there, is there any correlation? And I look at music and arts, for example. Once upon a time in this country, you know, all you heard was foreign music, you know, and I, I don't like to use the word foreign because it also carries its own connotation. But, you know, what has become today's Afrobeat 
it's so cool and it's so true to Nigeria. Other people have come to, have needed to understand it. Why is a lot of the search, you know, and a lot of the interest for traditional, you know, Nigerian and African religion, and to some extent, all the other things that follow it, why is it mostly driven from outside of Nigeria? Why are the people in Nigeria less interested, so it seems, mm -hmm. than those outside of Nigeria? I think because we have a society where we don't talk these things. I mean, even though you brought us here to have this conversation, God knows how many of the um, response we're going to get because of how they feel we're attacking. We're not attacking. There has to be some way of asking questions. When you are lost and you want to fix it, you must be able to ask the question. If your father or your mother is doing something that you don't understand, if you can't ask them, then you're going to go outside. Yeah. And that's what we have a scenario right now where we cannot ask the question among ourselves about why, what, how. So we have to go outside and get it on the outside. Change is coming, whether we like it or not. The music shows, the art, all of these things are speaking. And it's not like we went back out, we actually went in. Hmm. So if we've gone in on our art, on the music, why is that not going to happen on our spirituality? Hmm. And it was not exactly. saying you're just forsaking. a matter of time. Yeah, it's not saying you're forsaking what is actually happening, the, the Christianity or Muslim. But it has to connect. We have things that's on the outside and the inside is fine, trying to breathe. The argument sometimes young people would have, and it's not just young people, is that, well, everything that seems traditional to us seems, one, barbaric, two, repressive, you know, three, you know, um, um, just not, it just does not seem civilized or modern. You know, that's how, that's the, that's the question. So like, for example, Oh, we, when you hear about this, women must not do this. That's what you hear all the time. Women can't do this. Men, usually it's the women. Mm -hmm. Usually it's first and foremost women. Women can't move here. Women can't do this. Women can't do that. You know? So there's a sense that everything that's traditional in that way is anti-progress, anti-newness, anti-innovation, you know, and not prone or open to refining. But when you go back, you're not going to go back and carry all the stuff. Exactly. You're not everything. going back to carry all the stuff. Just as the, you talk about the West, they, were, they sold Christianity to Africa. You go back to them now, they didn't carry what they sold us. Mm. They didn't. But we carried it. Now we have to find our own, the same way we're moving to a new space. And that because new space, imitation is neurosis. Uh, <laughs> in that new space, we're going to understand literally what we've brought to the table because there's something in us that is clear our, our fathers and our father's father each generation has found a way to move exactly to learn yeah. to fix the new generation are going to do that mm. but they are also the core about that is when they're completely confident about that decision what they're moving forward but if you don't know where you're moving forward then you're carrying somebody else's right you spoke about this process being an internal one it's not external how important is this internal process to nation building? I keep build, bringing it back because what I've learned is that people don't change until they see the clear advantage to them hmm. in terms of their desires for life, hmm. their desires to progress, their desires to succeed, their desires. So how do, how do you, is there, what is the link between this case and the human desire to progress to succeed, to thrive. Now, if every individual is introspective and um, begins to ask questions and tries to understand what life is, then every individual in their own sphere would be successful. Now, the concept of success, again, is a day-to-day -day living where you have challenges or problems and this and that, and you resolve them reasonably without extreme chaos, and you're able to take life day after the other. Now, after a long period of time, this will amount to some kind of success. First, from the family circle to the community, and then to the nation. If everybody is trying to do things to an extent right, then the internal introspective understanding will now translate into a progressive 
nation building process. So how do you build a modern society on the basis of renewed African spirituality? How? The process? It's um, a total value system reorientation, especially of people that are of um, impressionable, people with impressionable minds, young people, probably a whole generation. Um, you more or less rebuild their thinking and you create models that trick their mind off what they are now used to. You change the model completely. It's, 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 a, it's, it's a cultural crisis. You know, it's a problem. It's a deep problem. And unless you do that, then that next generation is going to fall, is going to have to solve the same problems as the previous generation. That is not knowing who they are. Even the language we speak is not our language. We don't, we don't understand it enough. It doesn't carry the beliefs and the ideas that we, we own. It doesn't. It doesn't translate deeply the, the message and the information that we're trying to, you know, put out there. So why not teach people mathematics in Urubo language mm -hmm. or mathematics in Yoruba or mathematics in Hausa? Yes. Then they will truly understand what DYDX is, mm -hmm. which is simply how does this thing change with respect to that? You can describe it in your language, and I'm sure people will understand it. And they will ask more questions because you are using a language that is part and parcel of their belief, their system, and their understanding. So it's easier. You know, I was always going to come to that point of where language, comes <laughs> so, where, where, where language comes in because it's been a long, I mean, it's, it's something I've advocated for a long time, having not realized it early enough myself, you know, that if you don't teach, you know, the universal laws of life and what science, art, you know, chemistry, physics, biology, philosophy, all of it is about trying to understand life. Of course. If you don't teach it in a language that resonates with your soul, Hmm. You won't understand you know, it. You won't really understand no, it. You, you will see it as external. Exactly. So that's why people always think of things like tech and science as Oibo. And so even also when you are doing critical thinking, sometimes when you say, well, they say, ah, why are you being Oibo? And it's as if civilization is westernization. Or in some cases, easternization. And none of it is Africanization. When and how do you think Africa will join the rest you know, create, you know, a civilization from this part of the world. I, thank you so much for being in. It's, it's yes. literally the, it's, it's the, it's the heart of everything. And it's, it's often I what I can't remember the professor. I saw her video on YouTube. Sophie Oluwale. Ah. Oh, professor Sophie Dele. Yes, professor. yes. Do you know, <laughs> that nailed for me everything that we're talking about. And I feel this is where art plays a big role. Mm. Because now, listen to the music. Mm. It's no longer English. You've got Pidgin, you've got Yoruba, you've got Hausa, you've got Igbo, you've got all the languages. Now, when you can, when they now hear this music being enjoyed abroad, you're not so longer being embarrassed about it or admitting that you do understand it or you speak it. Mm. Now you're proud about it. Mm -hmm. Now you use it more. Now you realize that I don't even know how to write it. Mm -hmm. How come I don't know how to write the language that I'm singing and exactly. speaking in? So it's given us a tool to go, to actually go in more. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying that the, the future is bright. Mm -hmm. True. The future is bright for that same reason. And this is the role that art has now playing. Art was relegated when we were pursuing academics. It was a battle. And all the stuff that we had supposedly to do that yeah. would make us equal to the Western society. Yeah. But you can't go somewhere if you don't have the bottom holding you up. Mm -hmm. And this is where I feel now, with the idea that you can speak your own language, you can think in your own language, I feel that's where the shift will come. Right. I feel that's where the empowerment will come. Right. When you are true to yourself, it travels very, very, it, very, yeah. very far. Yeah. Is it? Or it as African as I can be. Of and course. it's not forced, it's not intent. It's, of just, course. it's the only way I can speak. It's, yeah. it's what is... 
it's the way I was born. Yeah. It's the way I was born. And it's the same thing with the music. When I sit down to write my song, the melody comes in Yoruba. So I have now have to call my cousin and say, eh, Sholami, help me. I'm hearing this Yoruba and I don't want to sing it and it come being back to front. <laughs> so fix me up. Wow. And it's that amazing. And what is there. I don't fight it. Yeah. And now I see people, when people listen to the music, even though I sing in English in Yoruba, the, one, the part that everyone is asking about is the Yoruba. Oh, so tell me that it does not carry. Yeah. Let, me even, let me even say something. Let's look at a word called love in English language. In Yoruba, interpreted, it means egwono, egwono. But what does egwono mean? Egwono really means to deeply and continuously desire. Hmm. So you cannot say, I don't love you anymore in Urubu. Do you understand? It's a process that once it's set on, on fire, that's it. It doesn't end. So it just shows you the relationship between words and their meanings, especially in our rich traditional African language. Right. Okay, well, I'm going to have to love you and leave you both. <laughs> I want to wait to that. that. I want to get the academic, ac academic, academician ah, struggle with my The orgasm. <laughs> The so that we can actually, and also get a practitioner, a modern day young female practitioner of a traditional religious system. In, I would like for the entire country to become confident. Do never say to a Nigerian, in Nigeria, uh -uh. you have a Nigerian accent. It says all those other weird, unidentifiable accents flying all around that we should question what it is and why. We need it. I'll take a break. This is where I work. So I'm going to take you in so you can see how it is. So you should come along. So this is basically the year we work, you know. Uh, these are African activists, as you can see. These are calabars with items inside. And these are cabins of different things, you see. It's just like you anything like a museum. Think about uh, Babalao place as a museum. When you get to a museum, you see all these ancient artifacts. This is made from Europa tree. Very beautiful, you see the sun. It's to call on the spirit in case we are doing ceremony. And it's very special to uh, Babalao, it's called as Iroke. And it's very special to Ifa, actually. Exactly. Uh, this is our uh, abs, in case it is about sickness or illness, you know, like viruses and stuff. These are abs, you know, in case of emergency, like when you are in the neighborhood and someone is just coming with a baby, like, help me and stuff. Just, you know, like a pharmacy, do you get me? You know, people coming here straight, you know, giving them medicine, making consultations for them about their past, future, present, you know, about their life issues. Like a therapist, you can talk what's going on in your life and stuff, then we do it. You know, when I wake up in the morning, maybe around five o'clock in the morning, I have to come here to pray. That's the first thing to do. Then I go shower and stuff. After that, I hit, then I come here to work. Our people will be already here sitting waiting for me, so I come here to do work. After that, maybe I want to study. This is just like my escape. And not even want to do their thing. They don't come to us that do this thing real. Like they don't visit my house, come down and ask about it. They just take all these banana trees out and stuff. You know, it's not fair to us. We don't do that. We go to schools and, you know, I have degrees in university and stuff. So it's not like we are just someone in the farmhouse, you know. You know that's, no, that's not what we are. We are human beings. So our number one enemy is in Hollywood. Number one, number two is people that are extremists with their religion. You have people, both in religions, where they say like, oh, no, no, I can't do that, you know. You know, you're trying to open like a band, and they hear their name, like, my name is Oshuni, you know, they're like, hey, now, can you just call it me? I say, no, my name is Oshuni. That does not have to matter. That's my name. That's my religion. You understand? So I have encountered things like that. When you go to school and be like, my name is Oshuni, I'm like, no, you don't have like Raphael or something. I said, no, I don't have it. Are you gonna take it or you let me go?
right, welcome back. It's public eye, and our conversation is on traditional religion's role in development of nations and civilization, especially for Nigeria. So I'm joined now on my right-hand side by Professor Oka Obono. Professor Obono is a professor of sociology at the University of Ibadan, where I went to. He spent over 20 years working on population, methodology, culture, communications, health, and policy issues at many, many universities. He's, a, he's been temporary advisor for over 20 years with the WHO and also guest faculty at Nigeria's elite National Defense College, Abuja, which is where all our military, you know, they go through it. He supervised many, many work and he writes a weekly, weekly newspaper column on the policy predica predicament of African states and civil society. That's a lot. Well, let's just try and... What do you do for fun? Exactly what you said. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Also joining him on this panel is a one-name wonder. You know, when you have one name, nobody questions you about anything. Ms. Muno Yedi is an Omenani practitioner. Um, she's an African indig indigenous teacher, healer, rights advocate, and spiritual guide with a focus on teaching a lifestyle of self-mastery and purpose under ordinary principle. She uses social media platforms to connect to people around the world and share oral traditions in a new way. Good afternoon. Nice to meet you. I mean, all of you, I mean, all this little person. <laughs> I love the idea of self-mastery. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to start from that. What does that have to do with anything? What do you mean by self-mastery? And what does that have to do okay. with development? If you, my people would say that simply means that if you don't know when the rain started beating you up, if you don't know how to check out your environment to know where the closest shade is. So to buttress that down is when you do not know yourself, when you have no idea of who you truly are, there is no headway. Hmm. You just keep going in a loop, keep repeating the same mistakes, the same patterns present themselves. You don't know what to do because you keep doing the same things you've been doing. You're not asking questions. You haven't decided that this is the time to find myself. You haven't begun the sacred journey, the pilgrimage to you. Right. Yes. You just did what they call shading. This sounds like shade for Nigeria <laughs> and us. And I'm going to take it from there, Professor, that why are we going around in circle? Why have we always gone around in circle? What is wrong? And what does tradition or traditional religion, what does it have to do with any of that? Um, the Nigerian psyche of the state, um, I dare say of the individual citizen, is not something that exists in complete harmony with itself. Uh, historically, you have had truncations. Uh, the people have not grown and developed at their own pace. At a certain point, a stock of young men and women was scattered beyond the continent in the transatlantic slave trade. And before that, there was the trans-Saharan slave trade. So you had the type of slave trade that arabized the northern part of Nigeria taking people away across the Sahara into slavery, and then the part of it, the type of it, that also arrested development and cutted away slaves across the Atlantic into Europe and the New World. This kind of historical development is not without consequences for how people look at the world. First of all, they look at the world as a kind of cosmic environment where they are underlings, they are servitors, they are servants, they are slaves. And then just at the point where they are perhaps prepared to normalize this anomaly, colonization begins. This also is not without implications for religious development. Christianity comes from the transatlantic slave trade and Islam comes from the trans-Saharan slave trade. It leaves very little space for the 
continuous development of indigenous religion. And it is in that kind of context that you will find the wholesome development of the soul, of the self that you were talking about, of the spirit even. When you have a society, in sociology we talk about the relationship between the self and the society. They are mirror images of each other. So if you have a society that is fragmented into different belief systems, there is no harmony among its parts. There are 389 ethnic groups in Nigeria. There's no coherence amongst them. What it tells you is that at the individual level, the citizens have fractured souls. And then at the national level, there's a fractured psyche as well. All this can be explained through historical development and the unwillingness, not necessarily inability, of Nigerians themselves to finally sit down and ask a simple question. What do we want and how do we get it? We haven't done that yet. Why is it hard for us to ask that question, Muna Yedi? Why do you suppose it is hard? To, because the questions were, I mean, we will come back to some of that issue of even the difference in the kind of colonization and the belief systems that Nigerians take on. Right now, the big issue is Fulani headsmen against farmers, Yoruba farmers, Igbos against you, the civil wars and all the hurts. There is all the resource control issues in the Niger Delta area. It just seems like such a pot of discord and fragmentation. So that question of who we are, why is it so hard for us to confront it, do you think? Well, I would say, first of all, that the reason why we are not asking a lot of questions is because we are people who learn not to improve upon the things that we have or the things that we know. But we are people who learn instead to obliterate our existence as it were and as we know it. And because we do not learn to preserve or to improve upon the things that we already have, we're trying to first bring, borrow things, too many things at once, and fit them in. So imagine trying to fit something square into a circle. Mm. So you, we keep jamming it into it and it's not working. Mm. And instead of us to pause and, you know, reconsider or take a sense of how far, like, why is this thing not working well? Just hit it any heights, let it enter. Mm. Why That's do you why. think that pausing, especially when you talk about it in relation to religion, traditional religion, people kick back? Because the idea is that, ah, you are talking about juju, they want to kill people, they want to have home trouble, they want to have, you know, everything concerning any idea of religious practices, traditional religious practices across board, it doesn't matter what part of the country it comes from, has a negative connotation. We cannot deny the fact that colonization played a big role, but also we cannot remove radical Pentecostalism from all of this. So there is the part where the colonial masters brought their religion to us. We're still able to practice. Some of us hid to practice, and that is why some of the things that have been passed out have been able to be passed out. Professor? From what Muno Yede has said, it's like, you know, the demonization of traditional religion is external. It's what's been done to us, it's what we have been shown to see. I mean, if it's even with the radical Pentecostalism, it's something that we've also taken on board. But some people argue that, well, everything that's come out of it, the fruits of it, has been nothing but repressive for people. And so that's why people don't even feel attracted to it in the first instance. Yeah, and uh, with due respect, obviously, to that opinion, uh, that's also reverse demonization. And I think the demonization of African traditional religion uh, began long before the Arusha meeting, which is the origin of Pentecostalism. It had to commence with the earliest missionaries who were trying to displace what they didn't understand. If you didn't have a central church where everybody gathered and prayed to one central monolithic being, then you hadn't found religion yet. What was going on, if you looked at what's called radical Pentecostalism, you need to look at its content demographically. 
these were upwardly mobile younger persons who had an education, but did not come from the kind of families that could benefit from the orthodoxies of Catholicism, for example. Their families were non knights. So they drifted into brethrenism. That's actually the name that Pentecostalism started, which means everybody is a brother. So brethrenism started as a movement of equal people. So there's something to be said about how it was approached, but there's also something to be said about what it realized. It was really telling us in the African systems that we needed to open up. We needed to be more liberal and liberating. And that the young people who were going into these radical Pentecostalisms, they are no different from the ones who shook the state to its roots recently that you cannot continue unleashing your police forces against us and keeping us in fear like that. That was a more recent representation of that attitude that you found in the so-called uh, radical. Uh, but, but having said that, if, like she's doing now, and this is something very honorable, this is very honorable, very refreshing. If we had commenced doing this kind of thing years ago, then the repression you are talking about, Nollywood is guilty of this. They do brilliant stuff, but every time it comes to African traditional religion, it is one bush somewhere with red cloth and chalk, horrible looking things that could give you nightmare. Whereas African religion is as much inside embedded in the ethics of daily living, in the advice a parent gives a child, and the reasons applied for the kind of advice. Why you must act with honor. Omoluabi among the Yoruba. You don't need to take somebody to a shrine to talk about goodness. Yet yeah, this is what is central at the core of African traditional religion are the ideas which are purified. We need to see schools that are organized to promote consciousness. To say that we want to educate a cross section. In fact, there should be compulsory primary education at that level too. Okay, which these practitioners are the ones who should also be involved in. They should be principals of those kinds of colleges and say, this is where we come from as a people. This is why we believe what we do. But that space is completely evacuated. And because not only nature, but society abhors a vacuum, there is a different kind of education that has taken its place. And then when that starts having consequences, we turn around and say, why? Is because we left it open. Before colonization, before slavery, that space was open. We did not gather them for, you know, in a structured way to transmit the kind of knowledge that everybody requires to exist as an African in today's world. All right. I need to take a break. I see, so I, I, I have to take a break. You know, when we, do, after the break, I'm going to take a few questions mm. and then I'm going to leave the audience with their own decisions. But well, first, I would like you to prescribe, because the idea for me is, how do we go from where we are to building African civilizations or contributing powerfully to existing civilizations of the world? Or well, after the break. Right. My name is Manu. Like the professor said, he said that uh, Nollywood has con contributed a lot to, the, to this traditional worship stuff. So... When I was growing up, watching Nollywood, Nollywood left a bad impression on uh, our traditional uh, worship religion. So everything they show in Nollywood is all about evil. It's about traditional worship is evil. So that thing left a bad impression on traditional worship. So, and again, when I was growing up, my dad used to tell me that uh, traditional worship, uh, they only watch the, they are witches and wizards. So that thing left a bad impression on me too. Like, uh, I wrote traditional worship as bad thing. So when I came here now, thing gave me a clear, clearer picture of traditional worship. So interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes. My name is Dan Oluwapo. Um, about what the professor said, is a question now, like traditional worship. What I know and what people usually believe is that tradition worship is evil, is bad. How can it be put out there to people that this traditional worship is not evil, like giving it to the people, uh, the citizen, or putting it online, or any means 
telling the people that they are, this perception of evil is not right. That's my question. Right. One thing that runs through everything is a central idea, a central belief that traditional religion is not good. What I am struggling to put across is, is our development ever, our full development ever going to happen as a people? And I'm talking in terms of turning people's, um, bring, pulling people out of poverty, developing a system and a process that helps to free millions and millions of people of poverty, that takes us into the modern century, that brings us forward in science, art, and tech. Is there any correlation between that and traditional religion whatsoever? Or is this, we should just jettison it, we should throw every one of it out, and the only way we're going to go is whatever way we're going now. I don't know what way we're going now. Let me start with you. Um, you? It's a mentality problem, how we think of ourselves. Let me give you a small example. Ask somebody to pronounce their name. That in itself is a problem. Because people don't even want to pronounce their own given names properly. If you cannot pronounce your own name, then is it other things that you will be interested in? Prof, so we're living through a historic time with the pandemic. There are vaccines flying across the world mm. from different parts of the world. Mm. We have no vaccines. Mm. We cannot mm. really afford to buy the very expensive vaccines mm -hmm. of the world. Eventually, we are going to be given vaccine and maybe we buy some vaccines because the rest of the world realizes that this is not a pandemic that they can cure themselves and leave everybody else behind. Is there a missed opportunity here for some sort of reawakening, you know, reach, you know, change of way? Why could we not make vaccines? There was a very massive opportunity missed here. And this is a conversation I'm really, really happy to have because it is directioned. At a time that COVID-19 pandemic commenced in Nigeria in February 2020, we were just a month away from the closure of the universities. The medical doctors were on strike. In the middle part of that pandemic that year, the Nigerian medical practitioners were asking government not to allow Chinese practitioners into the country because we didn't know what was going on. The government didn't listen to them. Its academic class were on strike over something as paltry as the mode of payment. That became an issue. When a pandemic was ravaging this country, and you needed at that time to go beyond what was the due of the, of the activists to even realize this is when to pump more money into virological studies, to open up the laboratories, incentivize even those in the diaspora to come down so that we can make a contribution, meaningful contribution to a global discourse that was taking place. We didn't do that. The two core people that were supposed to be front and center in this pandemic, and I'm not just like, you know, critiquing this. I'm a member of the scientific committee of the NCDC's COVID-19 Research Consortium. So I speak in that capacity, that it was a missed opportunity. The scientists were on strike, the medical doctors were on strike. So who were you prosecuting this pandemic with? You know, those are the sorts of things that happen in this country that make you wonder. They ramify into all kinds of other contradictions. But this particular one makes me sad because then we would have said, hey, here's what we're finding. The Trado medical practitioners could have said, hey, here's what we've discovered with herbs. Turmeric may do something. We would have then experimented it in open laboratories. There would have been that collaboration. But no. So here again, we are waiting for something which we could have produced ourselves. 
So it's a tragedy, you know, a normalized tragedy, and a, normal, a normalized tragedy that we are discussing. I'm going to leave the audience here on this cliffhanger and say on this show, we've had many, many topics. We've had a topic on traditional medicine. Mm. I am aware that a lot of work is going on and a lot of more work would need to be done. That's right. I myself take herbs. Yes, I've said it over and over and over again in that regard. Anything that has undergone the process of rigorous critical examination, open examination, I think that people will be more and more open to it. I think that what we can take from this is a continuous quest to determine how we would become a via viable and vibrant you know, nation of people. And anything, anything should not be off limits in the critical examination of that. Absolutely. That's where I'm going to do this for now. We we'll continue the conversation online through our social media platforms and on our website. Join us. We'll see you again next week. Remember, in the meantime, watch yourself. We'll be watching you. Bye-bye. <laughs>